Hey everybody, this next video lesson is going to talk about metallic properties, metallic bonding, and also touch on alloys. Hopefully it won't be too long of a video lesson, but you know how I get. Sometimes I just get rambling, but let's get started. This topic is covered in Chapter 12, Section 4 of our textbook. I've stolen these slides directly from Mr. Dirksen's Honors Chemistry PowerPoint, and these are going to be very similar to the notes that you saw in Honors Chemistry last year, if you took honors chemistry here at Egan High School. Metals behave unlike the other three solids that we discussed in a previous video lesson, which is why they have their own conversation. Now like ionic substances and like covalent network and also like molecular substances, they form crystalline structures. But the difference is that the electrons are not held tightly and are allowed to flow within the structure. You'll see on the next page, we refer to this as the electron C model. Now because the electrons aren't being held, this allows for electrons to flow between the nuclei of a, of a particular metal. And when electrons flow, well that is the definition of electricity. Now because the electrons are delocalized, which means that they don't belong to any one particular element, but they kind of belong to every element there, you, it's kind of like a potluck. You bring your food to the party, but everybody really has equal access to the, to the food. And so if each nucleus is a person, each bringing their own food, their set of electrons, and they share them with all the other people at the party, well then you can probably imagine the concept of the electron C model, where the electrons are the food. Because the electrons are shared between all of the different nuclei of a metal, this allows the metals to be malleable and ductile, which we'll talk more about on the next page. Typically, metals have lower melting points than ionic solids and covalent networks alike, but higher than molecules. Here's a look at the electron C model, which I made reference to on the last page. You see you have these nuclei, the positive nuclei, let's call this iron. These are typically your transition metals in that middle section of the periodic table but you've got an iron nucleus with 26 protons. And for each of those protons, there's an electron. Now those electrons don't stick around just one nucleus of iron. The iron nuclei form what looks like a crystal lattice, right? It's got rows and columns and they line up. And this is seen using a technique called X-ray crystallography where you run X-rays through a sample of metal and you can see the dense nuclei form these vertical and horizontal rows and columns. But what you don't see is the electrons. But we know the electrons are there. So for each positive nucleus that has 26 protons, there should be 26 electrons. But the electrons don't stay close to one particular nucleus. They kind of belong to all the different nuclei. And all the nuclei bring 26 electrons. And so you get this, this sea, this sloshing sea of what imagine would be liquid, but it's really electrons. And they can go to one side, they can slosh around, they're all negative, so they're all repelling each other. So they're always moving in between these spaces between the, the positively charged nuclei. But they're just always moving, sloshing and moving, and it's like a big ocean that never stops moving. You never see waves stop when you're sitting at the ocean, if you've had the luxury of ever watching the ocean. It is mesmerizing, because the waves never stop coming. Now because the Electrons don't belong to any one nucleus. They're able to flow among the nucleus of a sample of metal. That contributes to the concepts known as conduction of heat and conduction of electricity. Let's take a look at this situation. So you've got these nuclei all in horizontal rows and vertical columns with their electrons just kind of fitting in between the spaces. Now if you induce an electric current on this particular sample of metal, you will basically force the electrons to zoom away from the negative side and towards the positive side of that induced current. Remember, any energy source has two poles, a positive and a negative. If you hook those up, the positive and the negative. Well, the negative side, the electrons are going to flow away from the negative side towards the positive side, which is causing the flow of electricity. Because those electrons are just kind of sloshing around in between the nuclei, they can easily convert electrons moving into electricity. Also because those nuclei are fairly close to each other, but nothing's really holding them in place. Um, they're able to conduct heat as well. 
Say you put a heat source on one side of a sample of metal. Well, that be makes these first outside nuclei start to vibrate. But as they get warmer and they start to vibrate, they bump into the next ones, and then they bump into the next ones in this chain reaction that allows for the heat to be translated all the way down. So eventually you'll feel the heat all the way on this side, even though you are very, very far away from the heat source. It has to do with the fact that the nuclei have some freedom to move because they're not technically bonded to the nucleus next to them. We call it a metallic bond, but it's really not a bond like you think of an ionic bond. In an ionic bond, this is positive, and this is negative, and this is positive, and this is negative, and they have to be next to each other. But, and they're held at a distance because they can't get any closer to the positive nucleus uh, that are around it. It can get closer to the negative nucleus, but everything is kind of held in place. But in metallic bonding, these nuclei aren't held in place as strictly, and they can bump in and jostle into and bump into the ones next to them and cause heat to be conducted. Now the concepts of malleability and ductility have to do with the physical structure of the metal. Malleable means that it's able to be pounded into very thin sheets. Something that's malleable can be pounded very thin, like gold leaf. The reason metals are malleable, once again, has to do with the fact that these nuclei, well, they're all positively charged. If this was an ionic crystal lattice, this, uh, this would be positive, this would be negative, this would be positive, this would be negative, and they would be held very specifically in the spots. And that bond between positive and negative and positive and negative, specifically the ones between the positive and negative, maybe below it, this would be positive, negative, positive, negative, positive, that's very, very hard to break. But because these are all positively charged nuclei, if you pound on one side, the nuclei can essentially slide past one another because they're technically repelling each other and they're held in place kind of loosely, but they can slide past one another. And because they can slide past one another, when you hit it from the side, it can be pounded into very, very thin sheets. Ductile means that if you take a sample maybe of wire and you pull on it from two different sides, instead of snapping off in a very abrupt break, ductility means that it can be pulled thinner and thinner and thinner, and eventually it will break. It doesn't snap off to break like a rubber band, but more like it pulls really thin and eventually breaks very subtly or very softly. If you've ever taken a sample of clay and pulled from two different ends, and it begins to get thin in the middle and thinner and thinner and thinner the more you pull, and eventually it will break. But that is the concept of ductility. The last part of this video lesson is going to talk about metal alloys. Now, a metal alloy is when you basically mix two metals together. So you have not one pure metal, but a mixture of two or more metals. Now, there's two types of alloys. The first type of alloy is called a substitutional alloy. In a substitutional alloy, you have two atoms or two metals that have similar sizes in their atomic radius. And if you have two substances that are very similar, the other metal can maybe fit into a gap that is vacant of one of these gray colored metal atoms. So let's say there's a big gap here, and that is just a naturally occurring gap. Well, the second metal, the other metal that it's mixed with, can actually fit inside that gap. Now, it's not a perfect fit. As you can see, there's some space that is lost here. But because the atoms are very similar in size, you get what is known as a substitutional alloy. Now typically one of the metals has a greater percentage of the concentration in this mixture, and so the other one is a very, very small amount. But what happens is you still get the very similar vertical columns and horizontal rows, and the second metal that's introduced in this alloy doesn't interrupt the vertical columns and horizontal rows. And so you get a very uniform crystal structure, even if there are two different metals mixed together. An example of substitutional alloy is brass, and another example is bronze. Brass is a mixture of copper and zinc, and if you look on the periodic table, they're right next to each other. Copper is number 29, and zinc is number 30. So clearly, these two have very similar atomic radii. Bronze is copper mixed with tin. And tin is down a row and over a couple to the right, but its atomic radius is within an acceptable range to still be considered a substitutional alloy. Now, the term substitutional alloy comes from the fact that if you happen to have a pure metal, 
and then you take one of the atoms out, you could substitute it in with an atom of similar size. And that's how it gets its name, substitutional. Now the second type of alloy is called interstitial. And basically what you have is a pure metal. Once again, we'll use the gray spheres to represent a particular metal. And then what we do is we alloy or mix it in with a metal that has a significantly smaller atomic radius. And that particular element fits in the empty spaces between the gray colored atoms. And that's why it's called interstitial because it kind of gets into those really small nooks and crannies. Because the atomic radius is so small compared to the other elements of the metal, then typically what happens is they fit into those small cracks and crevices. Now it doesn't have to be another metal. It could be another element. For example, steel is an iron mixed with carbon. Back in the old days of blacksmithing, they found that if they were melting iron in hot, 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 hot conditions, and they pounded it in with the ashes of the wood, that the metal actually was stronger if they mixed it with the, the ashes of the wood. And it happened, they, they, they didn't know what they were doing at the time, but they were mixing the hot iron with carbon in the ash and then allowing it to cool. And what it did was make stronger metal because you're basically producing an interstitial alloy. You're creating steel from iron and carbon. Now carbon has a significantly smaller atomic radius compared to iron. And so you can see why something like this is the carbon atoms and then the gray atoms would be the iron in this case. Now you can have more than just two elements or two metals mixed together to make an alloy. An example is stainless steel. Stainless steel has iron and carbon, but also chromium, which gives it its luster or its very, very shiny appearance. Well, that takes care of this video lesson on metals, metallic bonding, and alloys. Thanks for listening.